They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. I see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here, Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Welcome to everybody who's going to join us live this afternoon. And to those who will see and hear this later, peace and welcome to you as well. I'm very excited to get into uh, this work that is new to me, but perfectly in line with what we've been discussing here on this show recently on Earn Your Liberation. Uh, and even this morning on Guerrilla Intellectual University with Kim Holder and Dr. Joy James. So um, before I go any farther and before I forget, big shout out to Richard Sheffield for putting me on to this work, heeding the request, responding to the request I put, I, I asked, put out the other day, requesting scholarship uh, of any kind that addresses specifically the question of how Africans in the world have engaged Marx and applied Marxist ideas to their work. So even those wanting to be critical of Marx and his involvement in all of this, I'm still looking for people who can produce or have produced work that I'm just not aware of that explains, again, not just what's wrong with Marx in terms of not in fully appreciating or encompassing or coming from the perspective of African people, but who at least can speak to with substance, even if, if, even if in critique of radical revolutionary Africans who have put Marx's ideas to work. So I really appreciate Richard responding. Uh, more work is coming. I have Professor Dove's work uh, coming as well to, 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 to follow up on this. But I wanted to actually start with where we, we were just the other day. Um, uh, and forgive me, to those in the chat, I'm going to, if you, I, I'll, I'll, catch, I'll catch up later. Uh, please, please forgive me. And uh, um, so if you have comments or questions, uh, I will, you know, look to compile them and get to them in just a little while. But uh just for my own, you know, staying focused. Uh, I want to try to, anyway, you, you get it. I, I think you appreciate that. And you all don't need me in the chat anyway. We all know that's clear. So, um, but I did want to start with where we sort of were with uh, Professor Dove and where we mentioned the other day when she was on with Professor Asante and the Earn Your uh, liberation crew. I hope I said liberation that first time, right? I didn't say earn your leisure by accident, did I? <laughs> I mean, I just don't want, I, I just don't, I, I just want to be clear. I, I know we're not the courteous top thought leader, but you know, we're also not. They want to have black businesses and not just go to the white businesses, and they should have. <laughs> but, <clears throat> um, so when I mentioned to Professor Dove the other day that I, I disagreed with how she approached in this work, Marx and his, his discussion of primitive accumulation, and believe me, this is going to figure prominently when I get to the subject specifically today. Um, what I didn't do during the show was, was specifically reference it as I, I think I had done in our initial review with the Earn Your Liberation crew. So I wanted to, to come back with that just for a second. Um, because she writes here, uh, well, Dove and Asante right here. And again, this is on being human being. Uh, 
on page 65. In highlighting the miserable, unconscionable state of the working European poor, Marx failed to give equal value to the humanity of the enslaved African people. By defining African enslavement slavery primit as primitive accumulation, a lower stage in human and economic development than capitalist accumulation, a higher stage in economic and human development, Marx marginalized and minimalized the lives and energies of African people, which were so critical to that process. So, again, as she was clear to reassure during the discussion that, that, that given that we've both read Marx, she understood what he meant. But when I said that, that Marx did not mean by primitive some sort of state of savagery per se, but that in an, meant more of an initial accumulation. And really what I wasn't clear enough in saying that we're going to talk about today is that from his point of view, the enslavement and colonization and, and theft and abuse of African people was fundamental as 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 uh, as as our as our as our lead author today says, paradigmatic that it was that it's from that basis that that African fundamental the 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 fundamental exploitation of African people that Marx built his 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 understanding of how you could end up describing white workers as suffering wage slavery. Not to be dismissive or disrespectful, but to understand and not to say that it was an evolution of humanity. I don't think so. I, again, I didn't agree with her on that. But anyway, but I think that's indicative of what our, the, 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 the author I'm dealing with today uh, that, that Richard Sheffield was so kind to share with me uh, addresses. So. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so let me bring in that work starting here <clears throat> let me get my get myself out the way starting here um with let's see um in review of african political economy <clears throat> or ROPE, Review of African Political Economy. Karl Marx's debt to African people, or Karl Marx's debt to, Af to people of African descent, rather. Now, that's a couple years old, uh, at least this story here in the article I'm gonna pull up is a couple years older than that, but I think it's, it's, it's fascinating and it's at least new to me, so. Uh, um, by Biko Agozino. Uh, so, and as it says here in this blog post, Biko Agozino argues that Karl Marx was among the few African theorists of his time who did not try to conceal his debt to Africa, but celebrated such knowledge as foundational. Agozino shows how people of African descent were central to the theory, practice, and writings of Marx. Marxism is not a Eurocentric ideology. All right. Fascinating work. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So as, as, as Biko starts off here, uh, described by one editor as nothing short of pathbreaking, I am pleased to have been invited by Rope.net to summarize in a blog post the arguments in my paper, The Africana Paradigm in Capital, The Debts of Karl Marx to People of African Descent. Uh, and I did locate and read last night or early this morning that article and uh we'll we'll come to it shortly uh though i think it's well summarized in this blog post um the original claim in the paper that marx borrowed from the knowledge and experiences of people of african descent has also been described as surprising by miko sarno who nevertheless concluded in his detailed intertextual review by stating that the paper has deepened the understanding of capital as a truly global critique of capitalism by a European author who was not Eurocentric. Adam Mayer wrote that the article demolished the myth that Marxism was a Eurocentric ideology incompatible with African pride. In this summary of the paper, I highlight the key points and clarify some issues raised by some authors. Contrary to claims made, cl claims by many that Marx was Eurocentric, just like other European intellectuals of his time, my article argued that people of African descent were central to the discourse of Marx. 
I suggested that the earlier work of Marx, such as the, the Manifesto of the Communist Party, may have misled some readers into assuming that his writings about class struggles dealt with only the European working class. This may be so because the history of slavery outlined in the manifesto referred mostly to ancient slavery in Europe, but my article also shows that some of the references in the manifesto concerned modern slavery in the New World. I delved into his mature work, Capital, to reveal that it was centered on people of African descent as the paradigm for explaining the struggle for liberation from oppression with emphasis on race, class, gender articulation, contrary to crude economists, fem feminists, and Afrocentric scholars alike who assume that Marx was concerned only with male European working class struggles. So I love the way he flipped it. And while I don't claim to be qualified to 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 fully be able to to vet his argument properly, I would at least like to argue that I find it fascinating. And in in terms of my bias in this this ongoing uh, pan African argument around African centered thought versus Marxism, I love that Biko here is as I interpret what he's done is arguing that neither is either, and we need all of it. In other words, African-centered thought is not as necessarily African-centered as it claims, and Marxist thought is not as Eurocentric as it has been claimed to be. Each reverberates off of one another, and all of which is necessary if we're going to get free. I, that's at least how I'm interpreting it. And again, it's clearly a biased reading. Um. Anyway, con continuing here, I concluded that, that I concluded that article by suggesting that the epistemology and methodology of Marx as a scholar activist who went beyond explaining the world and got involved in trying to change it for the better was a mirror image of the critical, creative, and centered paradigm that is privileged in Africana studies and other critical disciplines today. Now, personally, that was bars to me because in in my first of all, and I mix what I like, I took on the criticism of Marx that was inaccurate. And, and I was wrong for that. that. And I agreed with certain African-centered scholars who dismissed Marx as not being an activist. And that was wildly ignorant on my part. Marx was not only a, a, a grassroots organizer and activist, but he was you know, highly involved in, in emancipatory journalistic practice as well, which I think, well, not I think, was is clear to have been as much a part of what made him a threat as just his intellectual output. So, uh, you know, I like that that that, um, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. I just like his name, Biko. So I don't mean to be calling him by his first name like I know him. But but Agazino, I like that that Professor Agazino makes that point uh, here as well. Similarly. I like this, this that that continuing. Therefore, the work of Marx, uh, the work of Marx should remain among the required readings for scholar activists today, instead of being subjected to rejectionist ideologies out of fear of marginalization by dominant powers, or fear of the loss of originality if if Marx is uncritically accepted as being relevant to all current struggles globally. Now, this is where, again, for me personally, this gets very interesting. I'm sure for many others, it's interesting as well, maybe personally for you as well. But, but uh, and something I'll definitely be bringing up this week when we, when we uh, talk with uh, Josh Myers about his new work, uh, uh, um, uh, some of which is about Cedric Robinson. Uh, so I definitely would like to hear what, what Myers has to think uh, or what he thinks about this particular argument. Uh, so as, 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 uh, uh, Agozino says here, the rejectionist readings of Marx in relation to people of African descent can be illustrated in Cedric Robinson's influential text, Black Marxism, which dismissed Marxism as a Western construction with a philosophy, methodology, sociology, and historical perspective that is decidedly Western. People of African descent were challenged by Robinson to develop their own original theory and methods instead of relying on Marx. The charge of Eurocentrism against Marx 
can also be found in the work of Ryland Rabaka, who lumped Marx together with Max Weber and Emile Durkheim in his work against epistemic apartheid, where he held up the work of Du Bois, but did not add that Du Bois himself rightly found Marx to be an ally of, an, of the Africana struggle for social justice. Shout out to, to Professor Ryland Rabaka as well. Um, haven't been in touch in some years, but, but we had been in touch for some time some years ago. And uh, I appreciated his work, though I did not read this particular work and did not, uh, I don't remember at the time catching him in this, in, anyway, I, so anyway, but, but uh, the only problem I had with Rabaka, and I told him this at the time, the only problem I had with Rabaka is that he made positive reference to both me and Michael Eric Dyson in something that he wrote on the same page and I think in the same paragraph. And I was like, just seeing that was so disturbing to my consciousness. <laughs> I was like, and again, I was like, how could you see us both in a positive light? I was like, <laughs> one of us got to go. <laughs> you can't like us both. <laughs> anyway, shout out to him. But anyway, so I thought, anyway, I, I, it was good to see him referenced here, even if he's being criticized. Um, and I probably would agree here with the, with, in terms of, of the, the argument with, with what Biko was saying. But uh, anyway, uh, continuing on, in the work of Maleficate Asante, rejectionism appears to be a strategy for originality, lest Eurocentric scholars claim that Afrocentricity has nothing new to offer in an Afrocentric manifesto. Some feminist writers have also rejected Marxism under the mistaken assumption that it neglected the oppression of women under the mode of reproduction. All right, so let me pull up, get my notes back up here. So that, um, what he says here about Asante uh, is, you know, he takes a shot clearly, but I think we saw uh, in our discussion the other day that that what he says of Asante in, 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 in its core uh, is correct that that Asante, well, at least his 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 willingness to reject Marx. I won't I won't speak to what what the reasons might be, uh, and I don't know if Biko is right or wrong here about his suggestion here about Asante. But but the the rejection of Marx is clear, and we saw that on display just the other day uh, as well. Um, just moving ahead a little bit here, since Africana scholars are not. By the way, I linked. To this in the show description so whatever i pass you know, or you think i you know read incorrectly please uh you know don't hesitate to let you know any or all of us know uh you know and you know just just by simply put it in the comments and you know we can we can always come back to this uh and i i hope to come back to this and i hope to even have the the author join us at some point uh, since Africana scholars are not completely against citing the work of some European scholars with approval. Now, remember, this came up with our, in, in our discussion with Asante and Professor Dove, and, and Asante even you know, suggested that I had a point here. But anyway, since Africana scholars are not completely against citing the work of some European scholars with, with approval, the tendency among some of them to insist on rejecting the work of Marx is a curious case of the choice of allies especially when those who reject Marx rarely cite specific texts by him. There is absolutely no reason for the online journal Socialism and Democracy to fantasize about a science fiction gunfight between Marxists and Kawaida philosophers, Kawaida, Kawaida philosophers, a synthesis of nationalist, pan-Africans, and socialist ideas, since Kawaida and Marxism are not mutually exclusive or at war with each other. Now... Nah. Now that part, I haven't read what he's referring to here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that part alone. But I don't accept to say that I don't think I agree that that practitioners of either of those are not at odds or feel that there's a mutual exclusivity. Um, and in the article from which this blog post is written, and we can come. To, well, I'll bring that up in a little bit. Ag Agozino does does say that, curiously, that um, Karanga acknowledges <clears throat> sort of a, a, a socialist underpinning of uh, Kawaida. 
but <clears throat> I still don't think I'm ever saying that right. And it's probably because, you know, but whatever. But so anyway, that that I which I've I've always found odd because usually they're there's they're they're pitted against one another. Uh and in practice, I think pitted against one another. But Anyway, but I did, that was the point that I did want to, that I did, and I, I'm glad I at least raised it with Asante the other day, that that it's like, why would you, you know, like, you have all this room to praise Marshall McLuhan, and to a certain extent, Foucault, and, you know, he went on to talk about how he met McLuhan, and this, that, and the third, but, 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 but this full on rejection of any importance or value for Marx is, is very odd to me. Like he's like, so like, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> like Agozino says, it's, a, it's, it's a curious case of the choice of allies the curious case of a choice of allies. It's a, you know, it's, it's kind of like what I, it's, again, it's another version of what I was saying to the gentleman of crypto in our debate. You know, you hate socialism and Marx, but you have no, you want me to, but you have no problem quoting Max Kaiser and telling me that Warren Buffett has, well, not Warren Buffett because he hated crypto, crypto, but, but Max Kaiser or whoever the other, whatever, you know, uh, Peter Thiel or whatever has a point. It was like, mm, it's a curious case, but in this case, yeah. So you know why? Why this 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 overall disinterest in Marx, but but so much room is made uh, for others. Um, all right, I'm going to move ahead just a little bit to talk about to get to where he talks about because he makes some reference to how. Uh, Let's see. Well, no, I guess we should just, we should talk about some of this here. This is, yeah, actually, let me just keep going. On the other hand, Euro-communists, Agozino continues, may be responsible for the rejectionism for, from Africana scholars because they have tended to present Marxism as an exclusive heritage of European thought that should not be borrowed by people of African descent without obtaining permissions from the rightful owners. So again, I love this point. Because uh, first of all, as a hater, you know the, the 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 rules of hate, which you know are clear. Um, everyone can get it and hate harder. So everybody's getting it. He's giving sub to the Africanists, Africanas, the African centered. He's giving some to the to the to the to the whites. <laughs> everybody's getting it. So I love it, but. But I love this point as well. And this is, again, why in, in that what, one of my favorite discussions with Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier, I asked them about this. You know, like where, basically I was asking them, like, where is Nkrumah? Where is Sekou Ture? Where is Kwame Nkrumah in, in these analyses when we're learning about Marx, Lenin, Mao, et cetera, and so forth? Uh, uh, and I forgot exactly what they said. They always have good answers and responses. Uh, they're, they're dope, but. But in general, I think that what is being said here is correct, that white Marxists get real white when it comes to defending Marx as this, 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 the centerpiece of everything. Um, and so I, anyway, I think this is, that's a, a great point that, that is made here. The, the Africa born Eric uh, Hobsbawm in how to, how to Change the World, mistakenly asserted that the historical knowledge of Marx and Engels was non-existent in, on Africa. Far from it. There are hundreds of references to Africans and people of African descent and capital. I agree with the African-born Jacques Derrida that we all owe it to ourselves to return to an activist reading of the specters of Marx instead of shying away from the task of to avoiding being seen as trespassing on the exclusive private intellectual property rights of Marx and sons of Europe. And this point about, again, this speaks to the point I was trying to make the other day, or always I'm trying to make, that as, as Biko said earlier, there's very little reference and critiques of Marx to something Marx actually wrote. And then there's very little acknowledgement of, of, of grappling with all that he wrote 
or a, a, a good portion of what he wrote, or certainly something as centerpiece or as, as you know, as, as his culminating work, Capital. It, I mean, it's it's daunting. It's big. It's 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 dense. It's a lot in it. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be read. And if and if it's not, and if it's not understood or dealt with properly, then then probably the critique should be left out. Stuart Hall built partly on the teachings of C.L.R. James to offer an Africana interpretation of Marx and cultural studies, 1983, and his view Euro communism. Uh, anyway, I'm, let me let me move on because I think one of the points here, and forgive me for that, I'm not trying to diss anybody, but but I, I don't want to you know just read it. anyway. Um, but his point is that Stuart Hall is part of an African world community that added meaning and made more meaningful marks to the African world and world majority people. Similarly, Du Bois, C.L.R. James, Emma Carl Cabral, Walter Roddy, Franz Fanon, and Angela Davis, among others, saw the struggle against apartheid not only as class struggles, but also primarily as struggle against racism, sexism, imperialism, and articulation or intersectionality. To suggest that the class struggle was the only important struggle in apartheid South Africa, as Archie Mafaje implied, was mechanical and strategically misleading, as Ruth first stated in her response to Mafaje in a debate in, in Rope in 1978. Nathaniel, Nathaniel Norman, whose book we were just using in, in Intro to Black Studies the other semester, was right in listing Marxism as a major current in African-American studies and the Black Lives Matter movement is justified in organizing against racism, imperialism, part patriarchy globally. My article filled a gap in knowledge by going beyond what Marx could contribute to Africana studies and focusing on what Marx borrowed from Africana studies. Bars. I, I I actually I just I you know and obviously folks will let me know if I'm wrong but I I think that I just love what he's doing here. <laughs> Relying on the ease with which modern technology enables us to conduct a discourse analysis of soft copies of text, I use the PDF versions of Capital and other works by Marx to see the frequency with which he referred to the struggles of peoples of African descent against slavery, racism, and imperialism, and the struggles of women against sexism as part of his core concerns in opposition to racism, sexism, and imperialism. The difficulty of reading his hefty tomes in hard copies may be responsible for the fact that this gap in knowledge existed for so long before the research I conducted for the 2014 study. However, my discourse analysis should not be mistaken for a quantitative analysis just because I noted the frequency number of times that Marx referred to Africa and Africans. I love this too, by the way, because it just brought me back to grad school. And my whole the whole qualitative quantitative debate and and people you know the quantitatives always the, the, you know you gotta have the numbers and the numbers don't lie and all this other stuff we were like of course numbers lie and of course numbers don't tell the whole story and so I love that how what he does here with this by by not just counting the 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 uh, amount of times words appear or phrases appear but giving different weight to them. In a, in a more discursive way, in a discourse analysis, to account for the weight that a given mention or reference has to the overall argument. It's pretty dope. The notion that Europeans borrowed from Africa should not be surprising because Cheka de Giop early already warned that Africans should not be too quick to reject European ideas because when you scratch their surface, you will find that some of the most profound European ideas were borrowed or stolen from Africa. Now, again, this is perfectly timed for the discussion we just had with professors Asante and Dove because repeatedly in that discussion, if you remember, or please go back and check, they said to us, Czech Antigiop is a foundational source for why Marx is insufficient and ultimately irrelevant. Now, one of the questions that I had made a note to make, but did not have time or memory or whatever, to, didn't, it didn't come off in that interview, was I wanted to ask Asante, how come again, just like you'll say we don't need white folks over here, but then we need them when we're making references to McLuhan and Foucault and whoever. 
similarly will make references to to jump for his his analysis of African origins of civilization, for his 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 discussion of culture, but not for his federated states analysis, not for his material analyses, not for his past experience with Marxist organizations in college, and not for this reference here also in civilization or barbarism where he makes this point that we should not reject european ideas because there are still or as, as is being made the point here that those ideas themselves were stolen from africa anyway Karl Marx was among the few European scholars of his time who did not try to conceal his borrowings from Africa, but celebrated such knowledge as foundational. Although his references to Africa in volume one of Capital are few, numbering about six, a discourse analysis rather than a quantitative number crunching will show that the references to Africa are substantively higher because Marx indicated over and over again that the references to Africa were paradigmatic for understanding the capitalist system of production as a system of wage slavery. The only error that Marx made was to use the term common in his time, and since then, by referring to the human trafficking, trafficking of kidnapped Africans as a slave trade. Du Bois also called it a trade in his doctoral dissertation at Harvard University, even though he proved that it was suppressed by law. The Marxist theory of primitive accumulation rightly identified it as robbery, plunder, and violence, and as a consequence, Marxists should support the demand for reparative justice. On the Negro, the number of references increases to 14 in volume one of Capital, five times in volume three, and six times in Grundris, Grundris the methodological work in preparation for Capital. But these were not passing references for frequency or frequencies to be counted for quantitative analysis. They were foundational for Marxist theory. For example, Marx stated as follows, a Negro is a Negro. In certain circumstances, he becomes a slave. A mule is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain circumstances does it become capital. Outside these circumstances, it is no more capital than gold is intrinsically money. Or sugar is the price of sugar. Capital is a social relation of production. It is a historical relation of production. Here, Marx is giving here Marx was giving a definitive role of people of two people of African descent in the formation of the capitalist mode of production. The word slave was referenced 150 times in volume one and 72 times in volume three of Capital. In volume one, Marx critiqued Aristotle on the commodity fetishism of equal values because Aristotle failed to acknowledge that Greece was a slave society. What he was comparing were labors of equal value and not commodities. Africana studies would not refer to people as slaves and Marxists would agree that they should be called enslaved people. So I agree. I think that I, I think this is a good point that I think people who cur make cursory readings of Marx or who make readings of distilled readings of Marx can often just easily dismiss him as using retrograde language or making too infrequent a reference to African people and miss this and these, I think, very important points. And again, this is not to give him some undue praise or justice. It is, again, I think, to make the point that it's, well, I like how it's put here, that he owes a debt to Africa, to African thought, and that more specifically to me, his ideas in, in, in the workings of African people post Marx's lifetime, obviously, because he couldn't have written anything before he was alive, but, you know, post that time, in the hands of African people, his ideas have, have grown as he would have wanted beyond where they were and have led to some amazing revolutionary activity. Uh, anyway. In his preface to the first English edition of volume one of Capital, Engels observed that after the abolition of slavery, the next struggle was to revolutionize the relationship between capital and land. And he concluded perhaps an acknowledgement of Africana philosophy of nonviolence, that England held the promise of nonviolent revolution, 
provided the capitalists did not launch a pro-slavery rebellion. So this this part, um, and this is why, and, you know, so I'm just going to say for my bias, this is why we need George Jackson. This is why we need Fanon, uh, because I, I, one, I don't necessarily agree with Biko's point here about, or Agrovino, sorry, Professor Agrovino, I just like the name Biko. I, I, I don't, I don't think I agree with this point of this Africana philosophy of nonviolence. I don't, I don't even, I don't even think I understand what that means. Uh, and I certainly don't ascribe to it in the Africana world. I feel like I emerge from says something very different. Uh, in fact, challenges this, this Marxist idea that, that Agrovino talks about that, that through social democracy, or democratic socialism. Now, I don't want to. I know there's. Let me not. I'm. I'll be checked on that. That it can be done peacefully, and 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 I know that he had that. I think Trotsky and he had that disagree. I, you know, there was a disagreement with the Trotskyites and that kind of. I, so you know, I don't. I don't. Actually, I don't remember that. Let me let me step back from that. We, we'll refer. Uh, you know, calls have already been put out to Eugene and other experts. But but just the point is, is that. I don't think I agree with that part. That's all I'm saying. That's why I think it's great that we have the George Jacksons, the Fanons, the 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 Darubas, the the Asadas, and others who who could add some 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 importance to that. Um, yeah. So maybe if we, we we if this if we are able to set up this interview at some point, we will. Uh, I, I can ask about that. Anyway, he, Biko continues in this article to talk uh, more about again this 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 the the what I haven't seen enough of, and I remember and I remember trying to do this on Twitter a couple of years ago, and and to, you know to her credit and to Twitter's discredit, it, it didn't work out right. I tried to on Twitter read an article from Dr. CBS making this point. And, you know, Twitter maybe wasn't, the, and I remember asking if this is, maybe this isn't the space for this, but CBS had written an article making a similar point here that one of the, the shortcomings of Cedric Robinson's work was that he didn't give enough credit to what radical Africans have done with Marx's ideas. And Biko makes a similar point he, here or in the article, and I thought it was coming up in this paragraph, but maybe, because one of Biko's points is that, that African people have again something that Marx said he would have wanted in terms of saying in his own lifetime, I am not a Marxist, saying that he wanted people to apply his ideas to their specific contexts to find solutions or to advance solutions in in in, in their time and space. Um all right, so maybe I'll come back to that point about about Robinson, but but because I thought it was right here, but hold on a second. Or maybe, maybe did he say it earlier or is it in the article? All right, I'll bring it up in the article in, in just a second. So let me just wrap, wrap here by, anyway, with this. So, so he says here, Claudia Jones and later Angela Davis also underscored the relevance of Marxism to the scholar activism against racism, sexism, imperialism as articulated or, or the in, intersectional systems of oppression to be oppressed simultaneously. Fanon in Wretched of the Earth, Cabral in Unity and Struggle, and Rodney in How Europe Underdeveloped Africa reached similar conclusions. There are still Marxist political parties and activists in Africa, and they should be encouraged to unite to demonstrate the relevance of Marxism to Africana struggles against imperialism, racism, sexism globally, worldwide, and towards the social democratic building of People's Republic of Africa or the United Republic of African States. You do not need to be a Marxist to agree that, the, that, the, methodolo that the, methodolo the methodology of historical materialism is relevant to struggles on the ground in Africa and globally, not only to the European working class. All right, let me... Um, Let me pull up the, where did I put it? The article now, because I did go and find the original article that he wrote uh, from, and um, 
we can add a little bit more to this. And then if you have comments or questions, I will definitely uh, be in the chat momentarily to check them out. And uh, let's see. Okay. Um, by the way, on that Twitter, when I tried to do that thing where I was reading that article from CBS, um, Dr. CBS, uh, some folks on Twitter did not not appreciate it, and and all I was simply all I was simply saying was, look, I don't pretend to know what's going on entirely. I would just like I just thought the argument was interesting, um, but now that I see the argument being made yet again, um, or I guess technically, I guess technically, I think maybe this would have been even before. Um, it, it's, 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 I don't know, it's just fascinating. So anyway, this is the article, the original article from 2014, The Africana Paradigm and Capital, The Debts of Karl Marx to People of African Descent by Biko Agazino in the Review of African Political Economy. Um, so let's see where, let's see. Um, so he starts off here by quoting Cedric Robinson. as saying Marxism is a Western construction, a conceptualization of human affairs and historical development that is emergent from the historical experiences of European peoples mediated in turn through their civilization, their social orders and their cultures. Certainly its philosophical origins are decidedly Western, but the same must be said of its analytical assumptions, its historical perspective, its points of view. So shout out to Roberto in the background. I'm not sure if that's being picked up in the mic. Um, so Agozino starts off here by saying there's a scandal in social thought, namely the assumption of the primitive accumulation of social thought from the rest of us by the West, which proceeds by appropriating some indigenous thoughts and representing them as part of a universal logocentric Western tradition in hierarchical relationship with the Oriental. The rest of us react to this scandal either by denying any centricity in our own culture and history and embracing Occidentalism wholeheartedly as Fuki Fukuyama, has, Fukuyama did when he declared that only Western cultural ideas were worthy of longings at the end of, the history, at the end of history, only to be debunked by Derrida, or by rejecting Eurocentrism as ethnocentric and embracing nationalism unapologetically as Karenga did with the philosophy of Kawaida and the celebration of Kwanzaa. That's a that's a that's a that's a strong intro. However, many scholars of African descent, such as Du Bois, Padmore, Czech Anti Jup, Kwame Nkrumah, Amakal Cabral, Franz Fanon, Samir Amin, Walter Rodney, CLR James, Stuart Hall, and Gugi Wationgo, Malefi Asante, Malanga, Kar Malana Karenga. Oh, that's a misspelling there. Malana. Malanga, Malana Karenga, Terry Kershaw, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, Ife. I'm Excuse me, Amadiomi uh, Nkuru in in Zegu in Patricia Hill Collins on on Oye Ronke Oyumumi and Jacques Derrida, among others, have been able to reclaim some of the stolen legacies of people of African descent without losing their centeredness in Africology. This article addresses curious, a curious obsession in Africana studies or black studies, specifically the frequent reference to Marxism as a theory that must be rejected as Eurocentric, even while being identified as a major perspective adopted by many scholars in the field of Africana studies. Continuing rare exceptions include Abdullah Kalimat, who's been on our program, of course, who continues to advocate the relevance of the Marxist-Leninist approach to Africana studies in particular and to social sciences in general as ideology-driven endeavors. Similar views were held by Manning Marable from the perspective of democratic socialism following the legacies of Du Bois, CLR James, and Nkrumah. By the way, Note that year, 1983, that's a long way off from that 2000 and what, 12 alive reinvention, which I, I continue to not think he saw too much of that final ed edit, uh, but, but not, a lot of, not a lot of that Marxism was, was brought to positive uh, uh, depiction in, in, that, in that text. But anyway, but some of us remember Marable's early work, 
That's why I was like, what's going on? What's happening here? All right, anyway. To Asante, Marx was very much Eurocentric in his focus. There was no global idea to his initial formulation, despite the rallying cry, workers of the world unite. I like that sentence, by the way. I think that's a pretty good shot at, at Asante. That's pretty, that's pretty dope. So he wasn't worried about the world when he literally said workers of the world unite. <laughs> but anyway, uh, to him, when Marx and Engels proclaimed that the history of, of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, they must have meant the history of Europe. Their manifesto must have been for the European working classes and would prove problematic if applied outside Europe, more so when applied within Europe itself. Obviously, that continued on. Um, the rejectionist references to Marx and Africana studies are also found in Harold Cruz, who saw the crisis of the Negro intellectual as a crisis of the lack of theoretical originality and a tendency to parrot thinkers from other cultures. Now, again, oh man, I should have, uh, I, I still don't think I have access to it, but what is that, that essay in that, um, in that book edited by Christopher Simpson, but there's this great essay by, um, um, what's his name, the uh, Black historian, what's his name? Anyway, oh man, somebody in the chat will know, but but the, the, the oh man, he had written a, um, a book we used in a, in, a, in a class too, so this is really bad. But he, he wrote in this, in this book, he wrote a chapter about about the state's repression of the black materialist left and Robeson in particular and cited Harold and pull, recalled that Harold Cruz had his work supported that the, the crisis of the Negro intellectual was actually supported by the state in its distribution because of its critique of black Marxists and socialists, which I always thought was a fascinating uh, argument, a very challenging argument, um, given I know the importance of Cruz's work to many, including me, that, 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 and I, but I, but it, it, it rang is true in, in the sense that, cause when you read Harold Cruz, it's like, he's, he's taking shots at Clark, at Robeson, and it's like, mm, man, I'm, that's not, I'm not comfortable with that. And then you, then I read that, that chapter some years ago and it was, it was, that was a fascinating, I got to find that. I know the book was edited by Christopher Simpson. Um, but I, I so anyway, I, I would definitely want to uh, follow up on that as well. Um, anyway, continuing here. Uh, in talking about Cedric Robinson, however, however, Robinson cited only a letter by Marx in which he stated that understanding the enslavement of Africans was of crucial importance for the explanation of capitalism. So I definitely want to ask, I, you know, I want to bring this up with 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 with, with Professor Myers when 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 he shows up this week. Um, and I haven't finished, I haven't gotten too far in his new book, so I'm going to be struggling to, to read that over the next few days, at least some of it to to be somewhat of value as a, as a host, but, but I definitely want to ask him this question, what he thinks of this argument here. And, and uh, uh, in other words, how fair was Robinson to Marx's work? Uh, Agorvino here is arguing that, that he was not fair at all, making limited reference to Marx's work at all. I certainly don't remember. I didn't read it that closely. Wouldn't have been investigating it for that. That is Robinson's work at the time I was reading it. So I wouldn't, but I think it's a, but it rings true to me in, to, in terms of what I have always felt has been a response to my support for the use of Marx's work by those who do, don't want it, that I've never felt that, that, that those who are dismissing him or, or have gone much farther than, than he's white and Eurocentric. And I don't feel that they've actually grappled with his work. And I still have not found a satisfying response that says, yeah, he may have been Eurocentric and yeah, we may not need him this, that, and the third, but when people pick him up, they get busy in all kinds of really good ways. So like, I don't want to, that's why I'm like, can we not throw it out altogether? If, if at all, like, you know, like there's gotta be some value if for no other reason. Um, 
But curiously, Robinson said that this was a slight oversimplification without reference to the detailed study of the, this particular history, especially in Capital, Volume 1, and other major works of Marx. Several chapters in the African-American Studies Reader, edited by Normand, maintain this tradition of rejectionist references and often without specific citation of Mar specific work by Marx or by leading Marxists, even though Normand rightly listed Marxism as a major perspective in African-American studies. It's a really good point. It can't be denied if you're doing an overview of, of black thought and movements. It can't be denied, but there's such a, a, a resistance to grappling with something that has been obviously such, such. And it's interesting because the white version of this I got in grad school, too, because, you know, Marx is considered in 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 communication studies. In the field of communication studies, Marx is, is still often considered a founding father, at least by some. And we read a book. We were assigned a book in grad school, The Founding Fathers of Com Studies, and Marx was one of them. And yet the chapter on Marx, which was, I mean, really only there to make the point that he provided some value to the many people using his work in communication. So it's like, in other, in other words, so many people are using his work in comm studies or in the associated fields that would comprise communication studies that he couldn't be omitted. But at the same time, there's there was no continued investigation. And certainly those of us who wanted to continue to investigate him got in trouble for it. Got their funding pulled. Got called upstairs to people's offices. Man. Man. So I was like, well, I'm going to go read it some more then. <laughs> just, just, just out of spite. Tell me not to read. Now we're not going to talk about it. I'm going to go get all the books. Anyway. Um. So sim similar again, uh, um, well, this is where I was, what I was referring to. In the past, many prominent scholars of African descent in identified themselves as Marxists, even while reflecting on how to transcend Marxism, as Mark Marx would have insisted. In the historically specific and concrete struggles of people of African descent, these include activists and academics such as Du Bois, Woodson's, James, Roddy, Nkrumah, Cabral, Marable, West, Samir Amin, Ture, uh, Manduangu, Toyo, Oni, Hooks, Davis, Jones, and Chris Hani, my man. Resting power, Chris Hani. Defending the Marxist roots of theory of Kawaida that gave rise to the cultural revolution known as Kwanzaa, Karenga pointed out the diversity of origin and eclecticism in Marxism. I've not read this reference piece here. I've never heard that before. I don't remember anybody saying in Karenga giving credit to Marxism for anything. So that's deep. Surprisingly, no one has written to say how much Marxism itself was influenced by struggles of people of African descent, despite hundreds of references by Marx to those struggles as being central to the theoretical concerns. This article is not asking about what Marxism could contribute to Africana struggles, but what Africana struggles did contribute to the thinking of Marx himself. All I know is that I'm not a Marxist, Marx himself repeatedly said repeatedly, especially after some French revolutionaries started using violent means and calling themselves Marxists, whereas Marx and Engels stipulated the preferred strategy of forming a communist party to fight for power social dem democratically. Lenin later validated the strategy by naming his party the Social Democratic Party by defending the strategies of Social Democratic Revolution and by caring, clarifying that what is to be done is to set up newspaper to lead the education of oppressed classes. Following Lenin, Joe Slovo also defended the strategies of the National Democratic Revolution with reference to South Africa and Mandu, Mandunagu came to similar conclusions for Nigeria. There are clear references in Marx's writings to the Negro in Africa and the Americas and that he saw the liberation of enslaved Africans as the precondition for the liberation of wage slaves in Europe, not vice versa. He saw the liberation of enslaved Africans as the precondition for the liberation of wage slaves in Europe, not vice versa. Um... 
I love I love all of this. This is fascinating stuff. I got I, I this this thing about Karanga really was was fascinating to me. Uh, so I definitely and again, with all due respect to what whatever the accuracy of this argument of of about Mar Marx is, and to whatever Marx's true feelings were privately, from my point of view, I, you know. Well, let me put it this way. I would love to see what what a a, a, a well-schooled Marxist who agrees with Marx, at least this version of Marx, would say about a Chris Hani and his his argument and application of Marxism in his time and his thoughts on armed struggle versus voting, social democracy, democratic socialism, et cetera, and so forth. Or, or as we've been working with in slow motion here, uh, it, particularly in, the, in, in members only sessions, and we'll continue here shortly, th the BLA picking up Marx's work and the conclusions they reach, George Jackson picking up, Fanon, et cetera, and so forth. It's like what, what I, I, I'm, I know those arguments exist. I'm not familiar with them as, as much as I would like to, but that would be something I'd be very much interested in seeing continue maybe in this, this BPM, uh, uh, one day this BPM conference that we hope to have or host, or I hope that we host or something, you know. Anyway, so as he continues, this paper will focus on the debts that Marx owes the people to people of African descent by examining his mature works to understand the role pe played by people of African descent in the clarification of his thinking and the at the mature level. I will look at Capital because it was his last major work, by inference, perhaps the most advanced statement of his theory, or Marx's masterwork, according to Alcester, who failed to acknowledge the Africana paradigm in Capital. So again, that's one of the, I love this, this, this ongoing back and forth that Agrovino does here in, in, again, saying Africana studies, the Africana world needs to improve its uh, uh, engagement with Marx, but, but the white folks, haven't helped this either. They, in their own limited interpretation of Marx, in their own limiting of Marx through their own white supremacy, have discouraged or, or encouraged a, a, a dismissiveness among world majority people uh, that needs to be itself corrected. So we read, I read Alshitzer in grad school. Uh, he did some interesting work that I actually appreciated on the history of journalism and, and something like that there and this and that third. But so I, but I think, but, but I, it, it makes perfect sense that, that he and many others who would have been supporters of Marx's thought would have still been insufficient, you know, in, in understanding obviously the African world and so on and so forth, or even understanding or interpreting what Marx was saying about the African world, which Agavino was saying was much more sophisticated than he's been given credit for. Uh, Check out to Geop in 1981 was has wisely cautioned that Africans be wary of dismissing important theoretical and scientific discoveries as alien or Eurocentric because if we dig deeper, we will see such new discovery th that such new discoveries have ancient African roots. Marx is indicating that enslavement of Africans is the paradigm for understanding capitalist exploitation and not vice versa. I, I, I really, I. I, I I don't know that I fully understand this. I appreciate what I think he's saying, but I, I'm, I, I, I've had to sit with this phrase over and over and over again. I think my particular intellectual uh, uh, limitations are, are, re are reached in this phrasing or this thought, whatever, thought puzzle, as, as Dr. James said this morning. For me, it's a thought puzzle. Enslavement of Africans is the paradigm for understanding capitalist exploitation as opposed to vice versa, or that is that African enslavement is that that capitalism is the paradigm for African enslavement. So is Agovino saying that Marx was actually making a race first argument? <laughs> is Agovino actually saying that Marx was himself saying what many race first analysts have been arguing for years that you can't understand capitalism outside of its it being a material exponent of a white supremacist ethic or or view, worldview. Whereas Marxists and materialists would say, no, the white supremacy emanates from the materialist conditions of capital and, and, and the social relations that 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 engendered. Whew. That's why I got it. That's why we need to do this. We got to do this collectively. I need to do it collectively.
So everybody got to find this article. Unfortunately, I'm not going to make a link available to this article because I don't want to get, you know, in the extreme. Uh, 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 what happened to uh, um, uh, Aaron? Um, because that's what they that's what they were trying. That's the, the, what what Aaron um, what's his name was exposing when he was when when um, the federal government pushed him to kill himself, uh, which started with him sharing JSTOR files or making making it a something like that, making all that academic research hidden and compiled and colonized by by the the academic state apparatus, making it available. Uh, to people, uh, that's what got him targeted by the state. Because once you start pulling on that thread of who's controlling our knowledge, who's compiling the knowledge and accumulating it and distilling it and making it available to whom, you start pulling on all these dangerous threads and they push that that, that young man to kill himself. Uh, what's his last name? Somebody in the chat will remember. Aaron, Aaron some shout out to, you know, no disrespect. I'm not trying to, my memory's a mess. And I think, and I think, anyway. I think that work deserves respect. It's like, to me, I, I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but I, I do consider that kind of stuff like digital John Browning. Like, I, like I think what, again, what, what, what he and others were, were up to in exposing was, was, um, and that's why I like to, to, to keep in touch with Barrett Brown. You know, anyway, anyway, that's, anyway, let me, let me stay focused here. Um, but I, I anyway, I, I, when I first read that line, I, I, I sat with it. I want to sit with it again. And, you know, I, I, anyway, you know, Marx is indicating that the enslavement of Africans is the paradigm for in, understanding capitalist exploitation. The enslavement of Africans is the paradigm for understanding capitalist exploitation, not vice versa. He drew attention to the expropriation of farmers in Scotland and Ireland where the population was consciously reduced to make the arable land suitable for English sheep farmers who would supply the wool woolen factories with raw materials while surviving local farmers were driven to the urban slums and turned into factory slaves. Just at the end of last year, shout out to Baruch Gottlieb. Um, we're on the train in Amsterdam on our way to that Paul Robeson event and looking at the landscape, and he's pointing to the to to this same. Correct me if I'm wrong, Baruch, but this is exactly what he was saying was happening on on the countryside right now. Families who've been farming for however many however long are starting to lose their land as it gets accumulated and repurposed, and they're forced. What does he say here? Driven into the urban slums and turned into factory slaves. Marx is providing awareness that Africans were not the only ones oppressed for the benefit of capitalism, but he again emphasizes subtly that, the Af that African enslavement was the commercial paradigm for rosy capitalism. Although he paid attention to the genocide against Native Americans and to the colonization of India, he gave the central explanatory power for capitalism and the inevitability of a revolution up to the enslavement of Africans and the struggle for emancipation over and over again. Ooh, those are bars. He gave the central explanatory power for capitalism and the inevitability of a revolution to the enslavement of Africans and the struggle for emancipation. Mm. Mm. Here he's talking about what I would what I would want to come back to in, 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 as I continue to grow in this my my study of propaganda that that Marx is talking about here how how capitalist messaging turned its own people into supporting their own oppression <laughs> um, or to take credit for 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 the 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 abuse of of of, of Africans. Um, However, given the criminal nature of the hunting of black skins that Marx referred to as representing the lost last remnant of shame and conscience by the European nations that bragged cynically of every infamy that served them as a means to capitalist accumulation, he should have been more skeptical about the description of the crime as a trade because it was plunder and not trade in the real sense as he highly implied in his theory of primitive accumulation. So in other words, Algovino is here saying, and this is why I started with this quote from Dove, who I think does Marx truly unfairly in, in this recent work, um, because what Marx is saying about primitive accumulation, again, is not to denigrate African people. And it's not to say that in this sense that primitive is 
somehow civilizationally backwards. It's to say it's the first or initial stage. Or as Argovino is saying here, it's what sets the paradigm or the context to understand everything else that has emerged. At least what I think he's saying. That is Argovino of, of Marx. And he's saying here, yeah, Marx got a couple things wrong, including how he should have been more clear about the language. Of course, it's not a trade because you've just sat here, Marx, and, ex and, and exposed the plunder that is part of that initial primitive accumulation. So why would you then call it a trade? You belie your own analysis. So concluding this section here, Marx is quoted as saying, then colonization. Today, this is purely a subsidiary of the stock exchange in whose interest the European powers divided Africa a few years ago and the French conquered Tunis and Tonkin. Africa leased directly to companies, Niger, South Africa, German Southwest and German South East Africa, and Mashana land and, and Natal seized by roads for the stock exchange. Africa is mentioned four times on one page in volume three of Capital under, under supplement in which Engels linked colonization and the scramble for Africa to the stock exchange in a way that makes Africa central to the, to the development of imperialism. I gotta be, I gotta figure out a way to use that today. There is, it, it is, so when Diallo was saying on our show the other day, that earn your leisure is the is 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 work will set you free in the death camps. The constant invitation to have black people participate in the stock market has to be recognized, as Marx was saying then, as participating in your own enslavement. So he goes on to count how many times the word Negro is used uh, and then says here that Marx clarified the paradigmatic importance of, of the Negro to his theory when he stated in the footnote that follows, a Negro is a Negro. And I remember reading this. I remember, I actually remember reading this years ago um, and probably not fully appreciating it in this way, but a Negro is a Negro. In certain circumstances, he becomes a slave. In certain circumstances, so it is, a, I mean, it is a recognition of the humanity that then becomes enslaved. I think that's pretty clear. A mule is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain circumstances does it become capital. Outside these circumstances, it is no more capital than gold is intrinsically money or sugar is the price of sugar. Capital is a social relation of production. It is a historical relation of production. The Negro is mentioned five times in volume three of Capital, mainly on the, in the long quotation page, uh, page 251, from an American lawyer who was, addressing, who was addressing a justice for the South meeting and who asserted that the Negro was naturally conditioned to be enslaved, contrary to the view of Marx that there is no such thing as a natural slave. See, again, this is, this is, what, this is, this is for me what is so, so, so uh, again, uh, uh, my biases aside, I appreciate what Marx has done, and again, what his work has meant for many people in revolutionary struggles. But I just appreciate that that there's so much more to his work than he's given credit for, even especially by his critics. And it's so clear that 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 people who are dismissing him are not reading him closely enough, are not doing him justice. And then again, going back to that initial that, as Argovino said, is curious who our allies become. So the crypto people want Max Kaiser. Asante's comfortable with McLuhan. Uh, you know, so-and-so's comfortable with so-and-so. But when Marx comes up, it's like, oh, nah, 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 nah. Now, to be fair, some in our circles, you know, Dr. Haidt is like none of the above. So he's consistent. <laughs> But not everybody's that consistent. Anyway, this naked form of exploitation of labor convinced Marx that the enslaved would continue to seek freedom as a model for the exploited workers of Europe to adopt when their levels of consciousness were raised to that of a class for itself. In Grundrisse, what Grundrisse, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, which Marx wrote as a preparation for capital, the Negro is mentioned six times with telling insights into the paradigmatic role of people of African descent as leading revolutionaries from whom the workers of Europe should learn. 
The Times of November 1857 contains an utterly delightful cry of outrage on the part of West of a of a West Indian plant, plantation owner who regret who who's mad at that Africans are rebelling and and not working or whatever, not wanting to work. As far as they are concerned, meaning these Africans, capital does not exist as capital because autonomous wealth as such can exist only either on the basis of direct forced labor, slavery, or indirect forced labor, wage labor. Wealth confronts direct forced labor, not as capital, but rather as relation of domination. Thus, the relation of domination is the only thing which is reproduced on this basis for which wealth itself has value only as gratification, not as wealth itself, and which can therefore never generate general, never create general industriousness. <laughs> so the plantation owner is complaining that these black folks only want to work enough to feed and do what they need to survive and then they want to chill. And he's mad at that because they're not producing the surplus that makes him rich. This is why I've always known I was a revolutionary. All those times I did all that, 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 so that, 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 that employment sabotage is because I knew why am I doing this? Because I was, I was confronting because I was recognizing that wealth was either direct force labor, slavery, or indirect force labor, wage labor. So I'm either a, I'm either a slave or a wage slave, and I reject all of that. I like that Hassan Campbell joint. Um, there's the field, field slave. There's the house slave. Me, I'm a runaway. <laughs> Damn all of this. Anyway. Engels concluded in his preface to the English edition of 1886 by observing that Marx believed that England had the potential to be ripe for a peaceful legal revolution if the English ruling class did not embark on pro-slavery rebellion. This is an indirect reference to the fact that people of African descent, mainly through peaceful and legal means, conducted the resistance against slavery. I, 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 I struggled with this line, too. I, I, so this is where... I, is he because is is the argument that slavery ended or was adjusted or amended through peaceful means? I I'm not I that's I wasn't clear on this part. I, I that's the second time he kind of made that kind of that kind of reference. And when I read this line again, I don't you know I, I'm reading Marx is saying what Kwame Ture said that the issue of violence is not up to us. If they don't embark on a pro-slavery rebellion, okay. But they keep wanting to embark on pro-slavery rebellions. Anyway. For those who might complain that, uh, that some of, of these uh, confirm the feeling that Marx subscribed to the hierarchies of race according to dominant European views of the day. Note the irony with which Marx ended volume one of Capital by citing references to the fact that the so-called civilized Christian race of Europe was guilty of the most oppressive and exploitive relations with others uh, more than any other race. Marx clarified further in the discussion of primitive accumulation that his focus is on the human race as a whole. Marx said that the concept of primitive accumulation is analogical to the story of Adam and Eve, according to which Adam ate the apple and sin fell on the human race. According to the fable, there were two types of people. Those who worked hard, invested wisely, and were highly educated uh, are the ones who are wealthy, and those lazy rascals who waste their time and seek to rob or beg for a living or work but waste their wages rather than invest and save are the ones who are poor. Marx dismisses this fable as nonsensical childishness and explained that in actual history, primary accumulation or primitive accumulation of capital is not a mystery, but a reality documented in the forms of tremendous force, robbery, murder, and slavery as the root causes and not just the consequences of capitalist accumulation. Agozino, 2003. So again, going back to the, what I was saying to Professor Dove, I don't think it's appropriate for her to describe Marx's discussion of primitive accumulation as some sort of denigration of African people. That's not what I, that's not what I think he was saying. 
And again, it's not to, to, to defend him as a non-racist, although relatively speaking, he may, you know, but it's it's to to defend the incorporation of his ideas that should not be dismissed as a Eurocentric because they uh, are, are themselves inspired by, as is being pointed out here, an African world and, and its contributions. And B, because people who read Marx and apply Marx to their immediate conditions, particularly within the African world, continue to do some wildly revolutionary things. So why would we want to discourage that at all? If anything, it should, I would think the argument should be, let's accurately summarize Marx, as I don't think was done there, and then let's encourage that he be incorporated, maybe not centered, maybe not solely focused, but incorporated and maybe added on to with some of those mentioned here. Or again, explain to me why Rodney, Hani, and Jones, why they're all wrong. <laughs> um, Marx does talk about colonialism. Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation is also mentioned on seven pages to show that Lincoln only made the proclamation when he realized that he could not win the war and, and keep the country united without energetic arms, blood, and sweat of hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans. What, what Agovino does, it, Agozino, I, keep, I, I think I've been messing that up. Agozino does not mention is that letter that, I, uh, that, that Marx wrote Lincoln, which is, I think, him being facetious and saying, thank you, Lincoln, for freeing those slaves over there because you freed the wage slaves over here who no longer have to compete against that free labor. Um, anyway, Marx observed in the USA during slavery uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. The Confederate states in the southern USA came closer, closer. Lenin followed Marx directly by theorizing imperialism as a high stage of capitalism. He cited the case of racial divisions among workers in South Africa as one of the obstacles to socialist revolution, as Marx observed in the USA during slavery. Samir Amin, however, cautions against reading imperialism as a stage or even the highest stage of capitalism because it's always an essential part of the globalizing tendency of capitalism from its very beginning in African slavery. I think that's a great point. Shout out to Samir Amin, whose work uh, I certainly haven't given enough attention to, but I know is, is uh, you know, valuable. Um, similarly, uh, Agazino talks about, you know, what, you know what Marx has to say about gender, which is apparently uh, underappreciated as well. Um, quoting Claudia Jones here, it was out of my Jim Crow experiences as a young Negro woman, experiences likewise born of working class poverty that led me to join the Young Communist League and ch to choose the philo philosophy of my life, the science of Marxism, Leninism, that philosophy that not only rejects racist ideas, but is the antithesis of them. What Agozino is saying in this paper, I am suggesting that in fact Karl Marx followed the black radical tradition that predates him by centuries. So he's saying here Claudia Jones was simply a follower of Marx, like others belonging to the tradition of black Marxism. I didn't I don't know if I agree with this or understand this line, but like others belonging to the tradition of black Marxism, Claudia Jones was simply a follower of Karl Marx. So is he saying that 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 Robinson's argument was Claudia Jones and people like her were simply followers of Marx? But here he's Agazino is saying, I am suggesting that in fact the Karl Marx followed the black radical tradition that predated him. Uh, for Marx, Mill's bourgeois liberalism is superficial because he saw the, that because the in, inequality of men and women was the epiphenomenon of law, while in Marx's view, the root cause of inequality lay in the economic infrastructure of production relations that relied on labor exploitation for the benefit of private property. Marx not only For Marx, not only did workers remain in wage slavery, but all of the forms of slavery could not be abolished until actual enslavement of Africans was abolished. The emancipation of women following the abolition of slavery appears to bear Marx out. In other words, scholars of African descent have helped to rescue Marxism from crude economism by advancing the race, class, gender perspective. So this is what he was saying as I was summarizing in, his, in that other art, the, the summary of this article, that all these black scholars that seem to get short, short shrift 
along with Marx, uh, including C.L.R. James, Oliver Clark, Oliver Oliver Cox, and others, um, uh, don't get enough credit for adding to to Marx, which is what he would have wanted and encouraged anyway. So in conclusion, given careful lessons that Karl Marx drew from the struggles of people of African descent, which he saw as a paradigm for the struggles of the working class, this paper concludes that Africana scholars, scholars at home and abroad can ill afford to be hostile to Marx's tradition. This is not simply to follow Marx, but to demonstrate how Marx himself owes to people of African descent. Similarly, Marxists in general should be aware of the diversity of influences that constitute the theory and practice of historical materialism, in particular, its African influences. Of all the European founding fathers of modern sociology, Karl Marx is distinguished by the amount and quality of attention that he paid to, Af to people of African descent as a source of historical materialist lessons essential for understanding the class, race, gender struggles going on in the world. For this reason, Marx should be not be lumped together with Durkheim and Weber in the way that Rabaka did routinely when he repeatedly grouped the three together as Eurocentric authors in contrast to Du Bois. I think that's a, that's it. Anyway, so that's that's it. And I basically, if not entirely, agree. Um, all right. What did you all think? Comments, questions? Anybody want to bring anything up? We got a few more minutes at least, uh, or criticisms. Anybody? And if and if you want, I'll even put the link in the chat if anybody wants to jump in and offer up some thoughts. But uh, I just I just love it. Thanks again to, to to Richard Sheffield for putting me on to that. And again, since we just finished this conversation with Dove and Asante, in which some of this these topics overlapped, I thought this was perfectly timed, and I loved the reading uh, and the argument. And we'll look to get Brother Beep. Biko involved at some point. Um, yeah, right on. Thank you. Yeah, I thought so too. That, I mean, it, it was fascinating. Obviously, I didn't get into everything, can't do, do it fully justice. And I also don't pretend to understand everything that's being argued there. So um, in terms of the, the details of Marx, but my, but again, I just think it's clear that, that If for no other reason than his impact on African people, Marx deserves more, more credit than the, these, these quick. Oh, there you are. Hey, you in here. Right on, right on, right on. Thanks again. Right on. Glad you made it in here too. Um, just came from mild tame struggle on Marx. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, and for me, I admit it, like sometimes it's easy, to, you know, it's been in certain situations easy to get me to back up, you know, when, 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 like even Nasante the other day, it's a, it's, it, it, even as I'm sitting there disagreeing with him, when he gets into that thing, that, 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 um, that flow of, we don't need Marx. You know, I used to listen to, you know, Clark, I'm, you know, love Dr. Clark, you know, he, Johnny come lately and all that. We don't need him and all that. Okay, but the reality is that Clark studied Marx. So like I've always, one of my underlying critiques of my, even my own work on Clark back in the day was that I, I think I could have done more to make that point that, that I think Clark found it comfortable, particularly at the end of his life to take shots at Marx. But you know, he, but Clark wasn't like, he studied Marx. He, you know, and he, but anyway, but even then I would just disagree. Like we can't just be throwing marks out yeah. anyway. So the link at least to the blog post is, is in the show description. So you can at least get that. And then it links to the paper itself, uh, at least the, 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 um, <sighs> citation. Uh, so you can get the, the full article if you like. Um, and that's right. And, and I, I, that's exactly what I thought too. And as soon as, uh, um, you know, I'm going to dive in more to Myers' book this week and uh, next couple of days and Thursday, I think, is when we're set uh, to do to to have him. Yeah. One p.m. Thursday afternoon, he's going to come on uh, and we're going to uh, uh, chop it up. And I'm definitely going to ask him about this. And he is definitely qualified to respond. So. Um, yeah. 
anyway. Um, let's see. What else? I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. One p.m. Thursday. Yeah. I gotta. I gotta. Gotta kind of work around that class schedule. The semester started up again, so getting in where I can fit in. Um, but uh, uh, okay. Anyway, all right, good people. Make sure you do all these things here. Let's go ahead and support the channel. You know what I mean? And uh, thank you all very much for coming through. This this was it's it's great to be able to, to have this outlet for 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 this kind of stuff. And uh definitely take your time. Uh and I, I will definitely be be uh popping back in to to check. So if you got something to say later on, put it in the comments. And uh, we can definitely regroup and have parts two to a million. All right. So thanks again, everybody. Like Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. Definitely check out Gorilla Intellectual University. If you didn't see it this morning, uh, make sure you're on hand for the Remix Morning Show tomorrow. And make sure you got the bell and everything cl clicked up so that uh, you don't miss anything. Because I, who knows what's coming next? You never know. You never know. All right, everybody. Thanks again. Peace. If you're willing to fight it, fight for it. Like Fred Hampton used to say, catch you next time here. And I mix what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.